we're at a stage right now where it would appear to be we're on the precipice of a new chapter, right? We're on we're on kind of like the stepping off point into a new revolution of the human species. And I think it's always difficult to recognize, at least en masse, that that's happening. But we're becoming more cogent of it. We're becoming more aware that there is, you know, such disruption in this world. And I think that that's in some ways the prerequisite towards order, chaos order, order chaos, yin and yang, up and down, light and dark, hot and cold. So, you know, it's a very strange time we live in, you know, highly fluidic, highly dynamic, and we're in a hyper accelerated version of evolution. Nothing else on this planet's doing what we're doing. We are in some ways giving birth to the flying saucer, right? We're moving from the monkey to the flying saucer. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome or welcome back to another conversation in our collection of podcast series that focuses on markets and investing from a number of different and fascinating perspectives. In the Galactic Macro series, we want to explore and be part of the discussions that relate to the unexplained and unknown objects, as well as what's going on in the world of AI, because these two seemingly unrelated topics may indeed be related. This is a series that I not only find incredibly interesting, as well as intellectually challenging, but also very important, given the strong momentum we see at the moment in terms of releasing previously classified information, as well as the exponential adoption of AI tools by the wider public. We want to dig deep into the minds of some of the most prominent experts to help us better understand what this new galactic macro world may look like and how you should think about positioning yourself for it. And we want to explore their perspectives on a host of game-changing issues and hopefully dig out nuances in their work through meaningful conversations. So please enjoy today's episode hosted by David Dahl. Okay, thank you very much for the introductions, Niels. Jay, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today with uh, with Top Traders Unplugged. This is a, a very special series that we're putting together called the Galactic Macro Series. And you were really a focus of mine to have as our first guest. And I'm really proud to to introduce you and have you on the show and talk about what you do and and get into this fascinating subject that's a bit new for the investment community. Not new to you, but uh, certainly new to our audience. So uh, welcome to the show. Happy to have you with us. Thank you, David. And I'm really happy to be here as well. I was, you know, quite pleasantly surprised when you reached out uh, via email and said that you wanted to consider me as the first guest. So I really do hope I can uh, come across as uh, as sensible and, and rational because this subject is pretty outlandish and it does require a little bit of a suspension of disbelief at times. So uh, I hope I can do that for your audience. I, I'm I'm confident that you will. And, you know, as I've kind of described for, for people before, you know, one of the things that we do in the, the world of macro investing is that we look at the world, or in today's case, perhaps the universe, from the top down. And our job is to really connect the dots and try and interpret what might be going on out there. And, you know, one of the ways I think about what you do, and then I, I would love for you to tell the audience a little bit about it in, in your own words, is I, I equate you to an art gallery. And I'll explain why. So a lot of times you go into an art gallery and people are focused on the the talent of the, the artists. But some of the best galleries in the world, it is the curation of the art gallery owner. And what has struck me is, you know, as part of our team's own research, which involves your, you know, your program, Project Unity, you are just an expert curator. And you have really, as kind of this new kind of vanguard of folks, you know, looking into to UAP and kind of the phenomenon in a in a broader sense, um, 
you've just curated an incredible selection of, of folks. So what I think would be helpful for our audience to hear is tell us a little bit about Project Unity. We'll get into the end of the show, as you and I had talked about earlier. We'll talk about how you, your journey to this. But tell us a little bit about what you do right now and, 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 and your show. Well, uh, thank you, first of all, for the, for the kind words. And um, well, to start with, Project Unity is, is called Unity because I believe that there is a necessary symbiosis between, I suppose, what we could call uh, spirit and science or physics and metaphysics, logic and intuition, um, almost, you know, the two hemispheres of, of the psyche of, of the human being. Um, I feel that when married together, offer up evidence and information that might help us understand uh, this more unknown types of phenomena that are occurring. So Project Unity, as you said, it, it started off very organically. I was just kind of uploading little posts of me talking really to the camera and giving my perspective on this kind of, on this kind of thing. But over time, I was fortunate enough to get introduced to a few people who then became guests and it became me doing interviews. And, and from there, uh, my network over the last few years has grown um, exponentially, to be honest. I've been very fortunate to have guests on who represent the intelligence community, the military uh, you know, community, scientific community, journalism, uh, global high-level reporting journalism, critically acclaimed authors. Um, it's been a real journey. And my whole thing really from the get-go, and it maintains this, is I'm, I'm just learning. You know, I'm trying to learn. I'm just doing it publicly, and I'm letting people kind of come along that journey with me. And that's what each guest offers me is a, a little bit more insights or information into these types of issues. And it helped me over time as I became more embedded into this type of research community to see that these people do exist, that it's not just the really outlandish claims from people that are quite unreliable or you know might appear unreliable to the majority of people. You find that the deeper you dig into this, it's a, it's a completely different story. There are people representing uh, high levels of legitimacy in, in global industry, within government, it's uh, it's a sobering thing when you realize people who are much more intelligent than yourself have been very interested in this for a long time, and now it's starting to open up. So I'm just kind of in the process of, um, you know, keeping my finger on the pulse of the various things that are going on in the kind of congressional and Senate setting and, and in the government in the U.S., but also exploring what I consider to be actually the more important aspects for me personally, which are a little bit more abstract and kind of get into the philosophical perspective of what we might be dealing with here and the implications of it, because that's where I really like to see my uh, energy going towards is, is trying to understand the, the bigger picture that this represents rather than just simply saying, oh, it's a, a national security threat and you know going down that bureaucratic route. So yeah, that's kind of a, a good idea of what Project Unity represents, I think. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. And for for those listening today, because what's what's interesting is there's this process going on right now. Maybe the destigmatization of the of the subject. Um, you know, I've been on shows talking about you know crashed crashed craft from you know other planets, and you know that would be heresy. You know, even a few years back, still is in some circles today. But this is now becoming you know part of you know conversation, especially in the you know in the US Congress to maybe work backwards on the timeline because you've spent a lot of time looking and speaking to people, you know, involved with this stuff. The timeline arguably goes back since humanity's been around, there's some type of relationship. But to to bring it a little bit more present, one of the key years for me, and I'd be interested in 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 seeing kind of the timeline from from your view, you know, 2017 was a very key year where this went from something that was interesting to me as a as a hobby since I was a child to crossing into the professional sphere in in the investment space because the DoD was authenticating kind of chain of custody and releasing releasing videos is do you see 2017 as a as a key milestone year or what how do you view it in your timeline and and give the audience because let's assume that a lot of people listening have no have no idea what I'm talking about in 2017 all the way up to like what's going on right now. Yeah. Um no, you're absolutely right. I think this is really important from the get-go. Uh you know, just to highlight just how much the dynamic has shifted in relation to this particular issue because for decades this has been a subject that's been pushed to the side, you know, it's placed upon the fringes of discourse, it's considered the domain 
of the unintelligent, the easily fooled, perhaps the mentally unstable, or just people who are trying to trick the general public in an attempt at having 60 seconds of fame, you know, the hoaxes and the, and the snake oil salesmen and people like that. And, um, you know, it must be acknowledged that all of the above are present within this subject because it certainly does open up the floodgates for, uh, for delusion, for paranoia, for dishonesty to kind of run rampant. However, you know, what I discovered uh, for myself was that underneath this surface layer that often kind of presents itself as the barrier for serious intellectual study by those in traditional, uh, you know, academic or scientific circles, there exists a plethora of highly educated, highly qualified and reliable observers, researchers, witnesses, insiders, insiders being those within typically the uh, intelligence and military community architecture who've been involved in one way or another with this subject within an official capacity by Western governments. And so at the moment, obviously, and we'll talk about 2017, most notably uh, the United States government and those that make up the Five Eyes infrastructure. So that would be Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and my own country, the UK, uh, who is, you know, extremely quiet on this subject as the, uh, as the Americans are being louder, which is quite a telling thing if I, if I do say so myself. Um, what we've seen occur over the last five years or so is an attempt to reverse the generational stigma on the subject of UFOs. The first example, as you said, being um, the first major example, at least, of, of this sea change was the front page New York Times story by Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal in December of 2017. And that, and that you know, that article highlighted amongst other things, but the, the main premise of it was the uh, revealing of a Pentagon program, right? Previously unknown to the public, a classified program. It was known as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, nicknamed ATIP, uh, previously known uh, by another name, which was the Advanced uh, Aerospace Weapon Weapons Systems Application Program. They really love their long uh, program acronyms in the government. So yeah, it was the Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Application Program, or ORSAP. Uh, these were the two names given to this uh, previously hidden uh, Pentagon program. Um, and the purpose of which was the study, analysis, and evaluation of anomalous phenomena, including those that fit into the category of unidentified flying objects or, or UFOs or UAPs, as they now call them, unidentified anomalous phenomena. It was aerospace phenomena, it was aerial phenomena. They've been kind of changing it now. It's unidentified anomalous phenomena, which in fairness, I think is a, a pretty decent um, turn of phrase for it because we probably aren't just dealing with what we expect it to be, which is, you know, alien spaceships coming from planet whatever i think there's a deeply deeply uh, steep learning curve with uh, with this uh, with this subject when it comes to that but that's maybe part of the deeper discussion but yes this this 2017 new york times story by leslie kane and ralph and there's been plenty of interviews i've interviewed the two of them they're very you know uh, well respected journalists in their field and uh, it was <clears throat> you know lou elizondo that came out lou elizondo being the uh, the, the program manager for for atip and uh, essentially at least in the way it's been presented, kind of decided to leave uh, government because the Secretary of Defense at the time, who I've unfortunately forgotten the name of, um, was not being briefed on the comings and goings of ATIP and what was going on inside this program. And Lou Elizondo apparently discovered that, you know, chain of command weren't being told what they needed to be told. And uh, he was having a lot of resistance uh, internally from, um, you know, people who didn't think this should be looked at whatsoever. So he left the program uh, kind of took alongside him um, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Christopher Mellon, um, who was integral in getting what I imagine most people have seen by now, which is the three black and white infrared gun camera videos of the Tic Tac UFO and these other objects that were spotted in uh, 2004 with these naval training exercises. And all, all those pilots have come out on the record, people like Commander David Fravor and Alex Dietrich and Ryan Graves. You know, these are all uh, US Navy Top Gun graduate pilots, highly trained observers, weapon specialist operators who, uh, you know, it's literally their job to be able to identify everything moving in the sky. That's their, that's literally their job is to know everything from every kind of, you know, red team, blue team, doesn't matter, they need to know. And so, uh, you know, the fact that, for example, Commander David Fravor came out and said that when they were doing their uh, kind of uh, training exercise over, I think it was off the coast of San Diego in 2004, um, they were called off from their training exercise for what's called real world tasking, which means that something's actually happening. This is no longer training. You're going to be going off and you, you're doing something. 
And uh, I believe Commander David Fravor uh, said that he thought it was probably drug runners, you know, someone in a, a boat making their way over to the States. They just needed to spook these guys, you know, whatever whatever was required. So they start heading off, you know, to where the uh, target's been painted by the uh, by the Atflir radar. Now, it's important to mention the Atflir because it's the most advanced naval radar on the warships they have to offer. It's, you know, it's I, I don't know the technicalities of it, but people who do have assured us that this is, you know, this is the top next gen platform for radar and a deep penetration into the ocean and and uh, into the uh, into the air so you know they've got the whole gambit out there that day they've got the entirety of like you know the spearhead of the u.s navy doing its training ops so it means they have everything required to pick up targets very quickly and and start coordinating some form of a merge with them and uh, so that's what they were doing you know commander david fravor uh, the leader of the i think it's the black aces squadron um he's taking out a couple of people he's got his wizzo in the back the weapon specialist operator is in the back with him and uh you know they're starting to come towards this place they've been told to go on the radar and this is when according to David Fravor, he looks out the window and out in the middle of the ocean, they're seeing all this whitewash, all this kind of disruption on the water. So they, uh, you know, take a closer, closer look, banking around, kind of keeping an eye on it as they're banking. And what he notices was a small white looking object, like a pill shaped object hovering above the surface of the water, zipping around from side to side, diagonally, vert- like up and down side to side. He, he compared it to like a ping pong ball being thrown in a glass box, like just kind of bouncing around in very strange maneuvers. And being the kind of guy he was, he was like, you know what, I'm going to go check that out. I want to see what this is. So he starts this kind of parabolic arc down towards the, uh, towards the object. And apparently, as he's doing this, this object seems to like angle itself as if it's noticed the vehicle, noticed David Fravor, and is matching the same arcing maneuver, but it's coming up as he's going down. So they're both now locked in some strange arcing kind of maneuver together. He eventually balances out, and so does this object. And this is what he sees from the side of his cockpit, a 40-foot-long white tic-tac-shaped object, which is why it's been dubbed the tic-tac, like the little mints, little pill, like a little kind of or a gas canister, you know, no wings, no flight surfaces, no exhaust signatures, nothing that would be suggestive of prosaic traditional propulsion methods, no airframe. It's, it's literally an object that should not be hovering, hovering right next to his craft. He then said it proceeded to turn on its axis and it left the area like a bullet leaving a gun. It just shot off and within, I, I would imagine, half a second, it was no longer in their field of view. Um, and to quickly finish up that story, I wanted to kind of tell this story because if people haven't heard it, it's it's important to know that, you know, something like this actually did happen and they caught, you know, some grainy, I'll admit, but actual IR gun camera footage, um, you know, from the uh, from the radar. Oh, also, I, I have to correct myself. I think I called it the Atflir radar. It's the Aegis radar and the Atflir, the Atflir is the infrared gun camera on the on the actual fighter jets. The Aegis radar is what's on the warship, which is this highly advanced radar system, AEGIS. Atflir and Aegis, kind of similar, so I just mix those two up. But yeah, just to, just to correct the record. Um, but yeah, it shot off at the, sp- uh, at the speed of a, a bullet, and then he gets a comm check from, uh, I guess, you know, one of the warships or whoever's uh, manning the radar and says, you're not going to believe this, but that thing's at your cap point. And um, this is important because uh, <laughs> the the cap the cap point is a previously discussed, not transmitted electronically over over the system as they're coordinating the flight. This a cap point is the point next in the training exercise they're supposed to be moving to, which is happening in a briefing before they you know actually get in the jump seat and take flight. So this thing literally landed onto their exact next point of coordination with the exercise they were previously doing, which, you know, nobody can truly explain that. And there's all sorts of theories, but yeah, this, this, this happened. And, you know, the, the, the pilots have come out on the record. Um, and, you know, since then we've seen a continuing evolution in governmental discourse coming from the U S which has led up to what we see today, wherein we have bipartisan support within Congress and the Senate at a time where bipartisanship is rare. And, uh, you know, there is, there is dual support across the aisle on this issue, um, to investigate and obtain further clarity on the legacy and modern day involvement of the U S government and its military intelligence infrastructure on this subject. Now this was made evident, by the signing of the Defense Authorization Act of fiscal year 2023, which included language for the establishment of whistleblower protection laws for those who are under UFO-related non-disclosure agreements, as well as 
a demand for a multi-agency investigation into the actionable intelligence that's been coalesced on this issue since 1945. That was in the legislation since 1945 up to present day. So this is a brief, just a brief overview of the internal restructuring within the government and their their interactions and acknowledgements over the past few years in the public domain. And anyone listening can, you know, certainly go to my YouTube channel, for example, Project Unity, and get a more detailed overview of the sea change that's occurred. And I think it's evident via the interviews I've managed to conduct with congressmen, with scientists, with high-ranking military and intelligence personnel who voice their support for, and sometimes have even confessed their involvement in this subject matter, either in an official capacity or an unofficial capacity. So yeah, it's it's certainly no longer acceptable to simply laugh this subject away. I think only those who are radically uninformed on the modern day conversation are able to do that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And thank you for that overview, because I think that will help bring a lot of people up to speed. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of nuances in this. So, you know, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciative that you mentioned the cap point because the, the Tic Tac, uh, has gotten a lot of airtime. A lot of people have talked and talked to, to they, David. They Fraver even and, reported it on the BBC once in in the five years. Once <laughs> on the BBC. There you go. Yeah. So they they've been all over the point, and and I and I think what often gets missed that is to me one of the the keys to 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 going a little bit deeper into understanding what we're up against or working with or whatever it may be is is the cap point. This should not be ignored. It's like people get, you know, almost distracted with this, you know, this thing hovering over the ocean and moving at, you know, high speeds, which is reported with a lot of other stuff. But there is, when you get deeper and deeper into this, there is a undoubtedly linked connection between thought and consciousness and, and everything else. And to a lot of people that are just new to this, you, you know, usually the entry point is the science, right? Like, well, what are we seeing? Are we, you know, are these, you know, spacecraft from other galaxies? And, and you get into a lot of stuff right off the bat. Like I talk to people and they're like, well, you know, you get into all the faster than light, you know, theories, you know, how are they traveling across the galaxies? And, and it's more complicated than that. One of the interesting, you know, when they're renaming UFOs to UAPs. And so, you know, they went through all those iterations. One of the interesting ones that was temporary there for a moment for unidentified, um, you know, aerospace phenomenon was unidentified, you know, aerospace undersea phenomenon. That was actually fascinating to me because, you know, we, we forget that, that there's, there's, you know, lots of data under our oceans too. There's reports of things, you know, moving 400 knots, you know, <laughs> per hour under the, under the sea. And so, so for you, do you think that this is, there are multiple things going on? Do we have things, you know, coming from other galaxies, crossing dimensions, you know, right here? Like, let's, you know, let's speculate a little bit on this. You, you've talked to a, a, a wonderful community of very, very smart people on this subject. Where's kind of your thinking, you know, going with this and, and what you've gleaned? It's like I said, it's, it's, it's a very steep learning curve with the UFO subject. And I, th- I think it's advisable to, uh, you know, jump in from that nuts and bolts perspective, like you said, you know, in terms of the science and, and trying to understand at least, at least being able to absorb and, and recognize that actually there's very high level PhDs and, you know, multiple, uh, you know, people of, of, of high influence in government talking about this kind of stuff. You start going, okay, so there is, at least, uh, you know, it, it's not all just wild claims and it's not all just new age, whatever, you know, because there is a lot of that kind of, uh, that kind of stuff. But, um, I suppose for me, when I look at the history of the subject and recognize that it's, you know, it's been here for a long time and I do think it is a spectrum. I, I, I think that it's not a singular force. I, I'm, I'm quite open-minded to uh, different perspectives on what reality really is. I mean, I, uh, I, I would consider myself a, a layman who's highly interested in 
quantum physics and consciousness studies. And, uh, and I think that these two are actually basically the same thing. They just haven't realized it yet. And they're waiting to ca- kind of put it together. Project, project unity, symbiosis between spirit and science. Like I think these are two complementary lenses of observing reality that at the moment considered polarized for some reason. And I think that there is a, a, a real kind of entanglement that has to occur if we want to understand the UFO subject, because, you know, the deeper you get into it, it's amorphous. It's, um, it changes over time. It shifts. It could be the same thing that was noted down as the wheels of Ezekiel in the Bible, these wheels within wheels that were coming down from the sky. And it was a message from God. Obviously that's how it's interpreted. Now it's the Tic Tac flying past David Fravor. And it's, you know, it's, it, there's been these types of echoes of similar um, capabilities, but in different manifestations throughout history. There's even examples of flaming swords and shields in Roman battles that they witnessed and wrote down about. There's talk of uh, spherical objects in uh, dynastic Egypt in some of the texts. You know, the the Vamanas in India and the ancient Sanskrit teachings of these flying castles and vehicles. Even in the 1800s, we had this weird uh, flap of Zeppelin type things, airships that were being reported to do right angle which is turns. fascinating yeah it's like yeah. it's like for anybody that hasn't looked at that that's that's that uh, even on a standalone is is yeah. very interesting google to look at. Google, very google the google the 1800s airship mystery or flap or whatever you want to you know it will come up um it's it's a very interesting um series of of testimonies because it was happening very widely over mo- mostly europe i think it was uh, primarily over europe and um, these airships that were very extravagant, very extravagant airships, not not just like a, a basic kind of like patchwork Zeppelin they were popping together at that time, but like airships that had, you know, massive, massive plumes of, of, of uh, you know, uh, balloons coming from them. And they would be turning at incredible speeds and doing right angle turns and firing off into the distance. Sometimes there was even interactions with some of the people in these airships who were always described as very mysterious, um, humanoid, but mysterious. Um, so what I'm saying is that there is at least, and this was certainly the impression that uh, Jacques Vallée, who's a very uh, well-known uh, scientist who's been involved in an official and unofficial capacity in the UFO subject for the government, for the French government and for the uh, American government over the many decades. Um, he was partnered up with um, uh, J. Allen Hynek, who oversaw Project Blue Book, the US Air Force original, basically a, a debunking program because the end goal, uh, unbeknownst to uh, Alan Hynek at the time, but upon reflection, he certainly has on the record acknowledged that this was uh, basically just a way to cover up the UFO issue by filtering out the very important ones, siphoning them off into classified study and publishing all the, the very explainable, easy to you know explain away ones. So Jacques Vallée was partnered with him and uh, Jacques Vallée and also uh, the famed, uh, I believe, psychotherapist Carl Jung, uh, his his opinions on this was that this is some sort of framework of the collective consciousness of humanity. Now, I don't know if I'm going to go that far, but it's certainly an interesting and provocative idea to imagine that these um, these apparitions and manifestations, whether it be UFOs or other, you know, claimed anomalous phenomena, um, are symptoms of a collective overmind, a, a, a collective consciousness of humanity that is coaxing us into further states of evolution by presenting something that should be impossible to us. And we, we then go on the journey to realize and manifest the impossible into reality, which we've done many times throughout history from when we picked up the first stick and sharpened it into a spear. Humanity has been propagating technology into the uh, world as a, as a means of development, uh, of means of developing itself into what we see today, right? So technology is an extension of humanity's influence on this planet. And, uh, you know, what we see now is that we have this strange apparition that keeps manifesting over time that's just a little bit further ahead of the grain than we are at that point. And we keep going forward like the proverbial carrot on the stick in front of the human species. And um, one of my favorite kind of intellectual psychedelic explorers and philosophers is Terence McKenna, who's passed away, but he was, you know, kind of been immortalized on YouTube through the many lectures and you know, his one of his quotes that I just really stuck with me was that the human story is the story of the monkey becoming the flying saucer. And I have to say, when I look at the world today, I can start to see the components of that saucer being built by humanity. So who knows, this could be a ghost from our future, it could be an echo of our journey into time. 
Yeah, I love that. That's, you know, that's a, that's a great way to look at it. And, and for those, you know, again, you know, being mindful that, you know, what I always find in audiences, even in the investment community, you know, talking about this is that a lot of people, again, the stigma, um, there's a lot of creativity. There's a lot of people that have either had experiences or anything else. Um, if you've spent some time around this subject matter, one of the things that starts to become evident, you know, from the, you know, the reports, Jack's Valet, for example, is that, there is this kind of mimicry and and taunting or playing with us that is well documented at this point. Very, very, very well documented. And then the other thing too, and this is, you know, some of our, you know, professional curiosity around, you know, the timing and the there seems to be waves of when there are more of these experiences or encounters, right? And so one of the one of my favorite historical examples is you know, all the data that we have around um, nuclear bases. So, you know, we know George Knapp spent time in, 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 in Russia and, you know, verified that they had incidents over their nuclear bases and nuclear missile silos, you know, shut off, turned on. Robert Hastings wrote the book UFO and, and Nukes, which Lou Elizondo has cited and ATIP has, has used in Congress is, is reviewing. What's one of the things I would like to, to ask you, Jay, is, what are your thoughts as to why now? And and I, I want to ask this from two different perspectives. Why now is there this, there's been an exponential increase in, in encounters or whatever we want to label it. And not just because of fine tuning our, our radar data and having better technology. That's an element of it. But when you look at like the data that's being put forth, what Congress is talking about, we are having exponential increases in encounters. And it seems like kind of the, the last time we were close to having this many encounters was after, you know, creating the atomic bomb. And so, you know, my CTO, I was talking about this with Niels and I were having, you know, before we started the, you know, the show here, Niels and I were having a, a great conversation about AI. And, you know, I was sharing with him that our CTO's view is that, you know, maybe this has something to do with the inflection point of AI. The last time, you know, we had these encounters, you know, at this pace was, you know, the monkeys discovered, you know, nuclear bombs. And now the monkeys, you know, we've, we've figured out artificial intelligence or we're at that kind of crossover point. And so I was curious as to, to, to so it's a two part question. One, what's your, your personal view as to why this kind of increase now? And then second, because this is a question that I get all the time is why is the U.S. government you know, on this potential accelerated disclosure path right now? So two different questions, but rela related, perhaps. There are a few possible explanations for why now when it comes to the US government. I guess the one that's essentially been sold to us is that a few individuals with high level clearances who were occupying positions in government were wherein UFO related information flow was passing by their desks, uh, but not reaching their upper chain of command. Like I said, for example, the ATIP program manager, Lou Elizondo, uh, realizing that briefings um, on ATIP were not reaching the Secretary of Defense, subsequently causing Lou to resign in protest and take this information to the New York Times in 2017. So this is a this is a narrative that has been, you know, f to some extent sold uh, to us. And it's a good one. You know, it tells the story of uh, bold patriotic belief and the sacrifice of personal success for the greater good. Um, whether it's entirely true or not is a, another story. Uh, it's I think it's certainly worth just for the uh, purposes of being objective to say that Lou Elizondo is also a career counterintelligence officer. So, you know, we even if the process, yeah, you can't ignore that. So even if the process is actually, you know, for a good cause, we still have to maybe just maintain a, a level of skepticism over uh, the kind of core narratives that are being established and maybe challenge those narratives a little bit alongside it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And you can you can still be supportive of these people who are pushing for answers whilst trying to get answers yourself. So like that's kind of how, uh, you know, I would see it. But yeah, so it tells it tells a good story. Um, but the primary primary narrative being established here is that, you know, a few governmental outliers like Lou and, and the deputy assistant sec def, uh, uh, Christopher Mellon, uh, became disgruntled with the barriers being placed on this issue, came out, blew the whistle, so to speak. And, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's also ties into a very strange little kind of glitch in the matrix that I think people will be like, really, this is, this is what got the ball rolling. But um, for any punk rock star fans out there, Tom DeLong, the uh, lead singer from Blink One Eighty Two, which is wild. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Like, I mean, so I'm I'm 
pretty young guy. I'm 28. I kind of grew up listening to uh, to uh, Tom DeLonge. So it was like, hang on, the, the lead singer of Blink-182 is suddenly coming out about how he's got all these government insiders and he's talking to people on, you know, the inside of the government. I was like, what What, what are you talking about? He, what, <laughs> what the hell? And I went through the same process. Yeah. I was like, this is, you can't make this shit this up. Is, this is, yeah, <laughs> the, we, we are in the Matrix. We are, we are in the Matrix. Yeah. Like, this is crazy now. And so, you know, he goes on Joe Rogan. So for any Joe Rogan fans out there, he, he you know, he went on, he went on the JRE show. Uh, this is, uh, before 2017 so this is before the new york times post their story right and he was like big things are coming dude you know big things are coming <laughs> and like i'm yep. talking to all these guys on the inside and i was sitting there going like really and he's like i'm putting out this company called to the stars academy of arts and science and so i was like all right i'm i'm super intrigued so i go on the to the stars academy of arts and science and you know at the beginning it had all of these different governmental scientists and like people on there i was like whoa hang on who are these people then after Joe Rogan basically laughs the dude off, and I have to feel sorry for him. He got he caught a lot of flack. He caught a lot of flack for coming out early. Um, but it turns out he was right, and that Lou Elizondo knew him, and Christopher Mellon knew him, and the New York Times story was planned through them. And uh, To the Stars Academy housed all of these people. Like Lou, when he left the government from ATIP and you know in protest, he then joined TTSA, To the Stars Academy. Um, so this, yeah, it's the, wild. The, yeah, and you know <laughs> Tom DeLonge's been on radio shows talking about how you know he got um invited to like a lockheed martin conference like you know just like a public conference and they said oh would you like to be the guest speaker and he was like oh no would you like to introduce a speaker and he said apparently and he was saying this on the radio he was like you know i said to them uh, i said oh yeah but i want a meeting with your boss afterwards i want to have a meeting with your boss and so he got to meet the head of lockheed skunk works like lockheed martin this you know a tier one spearhead defense contractor for the u.s the top of the top um and he and he pitched to the stars academy of arts and science them and that was apparently the beginning he pitched ttsa to them and then he silently got in touch like got put in contact with lou elizondo with chris mellon before they all came out so believe it or not people this whole process including what's happening in the senate congress the, the uh, drawing up of legislation for whistleblowers was coming from the inspired mind of a punk rock star <laughs> who just had the fit had the fame and money to kick some doors down and say some stuff. So yeah, like that's actually the beginning of that whole process is, is, is this why they agreed to do it. That's a different why that's a different question. He was actually in touch, um, Tom DeLong early on, and this was actually found out through WikiLeaks, you know, WikiLeaks, uh, leaked all of the Podesta emails and Podesta. Yes, I remember. Yeah. People can still find these by the way. Um, if you type in on WikiLeaks, Podesta, um, Tom DeLong UFO disclosure, like things like that. It will come up with all of these emails between, um, cause he was on, I think Obama's staff at that point, uh, if I remember correctly, but he was having all of these exchanges with Tom DeLong and Tom DeLong was like, I'm being put in touch with, uh, general, uh, Neil McCasland and Neil McCasland ran like the special projects for Wright Patterson air force base. And, quick little bit of ufo law for people who aren't familiar yeah give every, yeah i was gonna say take a moment and tell everybody the importance of of that particular base well wright patterson air force base is supposedly where the roswell material was supposed to have been taken back in the 90 back in 1947 it was apparently flown out to wright pat and put into you know a special access program within the wright patterson infrastructure and neil mccaslin was around at this kind of period and was eventually the manager of the of right pat like he, he was running the special projects and everything so i think it's really important to just highlight that one of the original people that tom DeLong in emails to john podesta that were leaked out um through wikileaks are saying i'm talking to general mccasland and he's a true believer he knows this is real he's putting me in contact with people that i, I can't believe i'm being put in contact with so tom DeLong, i think had the money the fame and he was already a researcher he, he's had a long-standing interest in his subject so he knew his he knew what he was talking about you know he, he at least he he knew how to say what he wanted to say and uh and he was granted access and i think they saw him as a way to kind of you know get some form of a narrative out there now that's where it comes back to you know we have to be skeptical because he kind of just got swamped by the intelligence community and they kind of in, brought him into the fold a little bit and created this thing with him and it's worth mentioning that some of the main players like chris mellon and lou elizondo and some others have now left to the stars academy of arts and science they're no longer really associated with that and to the uh, to the stars academy of arts and science is now to the stars media 
and it's a media group. It it, it kind of got defanged. Uh, I don't know if it was purposefully defanged. I don't know if it was just a kind of cause and effect. The, I know they had issues um, with raising the money they thought they needed to kind of kick everything off. But either way, TTSA kind of got abandoned. Tom DeLong, I think, is still having conversations with these people, but kind of got thrown to the side a little bit by the looks of it. And so, you know, there is an element of, okay, was he just kind of seen as the very useful person that they could utilize for a certain reason? And maybe we don't know the full reason. You know, maybe that's not the public narrative. And I think it's fair to question that and just kind of at least remain skeptical of what's really going on behind the deep, deep scenes in government, because it's an important question you ask. Why? Why, why, why? Why now? they've had the book closed on this subject for seven decades like they've literally managed to convince the world it's not sensible to believe in this they've managed to convince sensible uh, you know intelligent scientists and and people that could be really useful in this field to turn away from it for the most part there are obviously amazing representation but for the most part in the mainstream you know it's not it's it's laughed at um so why open it up why open it up and this leads into what you wanted me to uh, answer uh, initially about my own perspective on on why now and you brought up uh, actually one of my main points of uh, of interest when it comes to why now ai and the concept of a singularity and i don't feel like i'm an extremely knowledgeable person on ai i've spoken to and i'm friends with people who are ceos in the ai industry and people who are really leading the charge on either developing or warning about ai kind of both slices of the pie and um, sometimes they're the same person you know it's it's a very strange thing the ai landscape because i think people really want to leverage it but at the same time we're seeing this this kind of exponential acceleration and capability that is becoming scary i mean you know people are Without a doubt, without a doubt. And I don't think enough people recognize that. I've noticed that my AI talks are kind of the lower view talks on my channel. So I, I want people to recognize these two things, in my opinion, in terms of AIs and, and UFOs is is correlated uh, to a certain degree. Um, like you said, and you, you, you rightfully mentioned the nuclear flap. Uh, when we first started detonating nuclear weapons and doing that out in the deserts of New Mexico. Um, this is undeniable that there was a significant rise in not just reporting, but credible reporting from military personnel and police officers and people who had a higher standing in, in the communities that they were a part of, right? And um, they have been reporting these flying saucers coming over, uh, you know, nuclear test ranges. In fact, even Gordon Cooper, one of the, uh, is it, uh, oh, I've, I've blanked on the, Mercury, Mercury astronaut, um, you know, Gordon Cooper, who was like a, a colonel, I think he retires a colonel from the US Air Force, you know, this guy was a serious player. He even talked about them having video footage of an object coming down and landing in a dry lake bed, and they were filming this, and then it basically just loitered for a moment and then went back up and, and flew away. Well, and it's notable too. remember this, and I think a lot of people wouldn't know the timeline difference, but, you know, the most famous UFO case that you know, almost everybody's heard of is, is Roswell, but Roswell is 1947 and the National Defense Authorization Act goes back. It's not by accident, it goes to 45, right? So, so there's, you, you know, the, Roswell was not the first, you know, incident that, that we had identified. Um, and so it's, that was fascinating to me just in and of itself. That, that, you know, we're going that far back. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, the relevance of, of that is definitely tying into this uh, this nuclear revolution that we had because, um, you know, and there's been plenty of claims and I will, you know, admit that there isn't actually a, you know, kind of hardcore science on it. So these are claims uh, for the most part, but the nuclear detonations do a lot more than just kind of permeate through our atmosphere. There is energetic signatures that can disrupt things that we aren't aware of as little monkeys on a planet throwing missiles at each other and not recognizing the shock waves that might be permeating, permeating out through space-time, um, scalar, longitudinal electromagnet electromagnetic waves, and um, you know that type of thing that might have caused a bit of a light bulb flash from our planet to say, hello, we've created devastating world destroyers and, uh, you know, something that has a little bit more sophistication and capability was like, right, it's time to kind of really keep an eye on these people. And, uh, you know, there's also the famous Foo Fighters, not the band, you know, they actually named themselves, they named themselves that because, because of the, because of it, they, they, he was into it. I think it was uh, Dave that renamed it. Uh, but yeah, Foo Fighters um, were originally captured in World War II and by pilots. And these were 
white or like, you know, different colored orbs of light that were flying around the battle space when they were having dogfights. And they've got photos of these where you've got, you know, it's a black and white grainy World War II photo, but there's these weird white dots on some, and testimonies, you know, to go along with it, not just photographs, but testimonies from pilots of like, yeah, these things would just fly around. They actually thought it might be a, a, some form of a, a Wunderwaffe. They thought it was a, a super weapon from the Germans. And the Germans thought it was a super weapon from the Allies. So there was all this confusion about what, what is this, what are these things? But they just, they never interacted other than what appeared to be observation. Observation. And I would say these are some form of probe, some form of drone, um, high, obviously high technology um, that was observing and watching. And the same with nuclear. And so to get to present day, I think it's the same with AI. I think it's the same with AI and quantum uh, computation. Um, because because this is the uh, precursor for artificial general intelligence, which is then obviously the precursor towards what we have dubbed as the singularity, um, which is, you know, for, for anyone who doesn't really know, I mean, I guess the traditional singularity is the birth of AGI, artificial general intelligence, a super intelligence that essentially takes over, um, you know, think terminator and the matrix and obviously these these are the catastrophic pictures we paint as humans we we you know we tend to as human beings catastrophize as a, as a therapist might say so we envision the worst possible outcome and kind of focus on it so i mean you know our expressions of what's agi is the matrix or the terminator or you know blade runner and things like this um there is also the you know, Star Trek type of expressions and, and like other types of ideas of a, maybe a more utopian or at the very least balanced and more free society that can explore the universe. And, you know, that's where I'd love to cash my chips. I mean, I try and be optimistic, but not to the point of ignorance, you know what I mean? So uh, you have to look at the control structures and power dynamics in this world and say, well, if they're leveraging it, it's going to start looking a lot like the CCP. So, I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily a comforting thought, but I do genuinely believe in the spark of human hope and, and to kind of push forward through extremely difficult times. And I think we're in extremely difficult times, uh, you know, in various arenas of the global story right now, you know, not just dealing with potential non-human entities, but just human entities, I think, are actually a bigger concern than the, the, non, the non-human entities. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that that's all... I mean, if I if I can get a little bit philosophical, I suppose I look at it in the context of my own life, and I think about all of the moments in my life where you know things have kind of fallen apart, and it's it, it, you can't see the, the the sliver of light on the horizon, and you know whatever it might be, we've all had these ups and downs and dark moments in our life, and then it shifts and it changes. So you're always proven wrong in terms of oh my god, it's never going to get better again, is it? And then it does, and so I look at that on the macroscopic level with the collective and think of you know the human species as a single human. Human. We're going through evolution, man. We're growing up. We're a young species. We are a young species, at least in this expression, to say nothing of previous cataclysmic events, if if true. You know, you never know. We might have had the, re- the reset button basically inadvertently pushed on us. Um, but this expression of humanity has certainly not been around for very long. And, you know, we're going to make a lot of errors, just like a kid burning its hand or, or being mean or, you know, not being able to share properly. I mean, look at the way that we grasp territory and resources and assets. We're like a toddler that doesn't know how to share on the playground you know so i think that there is an element of growth and with growth comes breakage you know you break a muscle fiber it grows back with strength so there is a level of evolutionary breakage that i think needs to occur for a species to develop in sophistication and advancement and in consciousness you know in consciousness in in the spirit of humanity itself not just in technological sophistication that alone is uh, i believe a road paved with you know mutually assured destruction like that's that's where a fully technological uh, logic orientated species would inevitably end up i believe is is destroying themselves in many ways you need the empathy and the side of the human spirit that talks to something bigger and greater whether whether you have a, a refined belief in something or not there is a inherent mystery to being aware at all being a human at all just being here and experiencing life isn't it is an inherent mystery so you know i think that we're at a stage right now where it would appear to be we're on the precipice of a new chapter, right? We're on we're on kind of like the stepping off point into a new revolution of the human species. And I think it's always difficult to recognize, at least en masse, that that's happening. But we're becoming more cogent of it. We're becoming more aware that there is, you know, such disruption in this world. And I think that that's 
in some ways, the prerequisite towards order, chaos, order, order, chaos, yin and yang, up and down, light and dark, hot and cold. You know, we are in a relatively dualistic universe. And so I kind of think if everything's falling apart now, it must be because something new is emerging from it. And whilst you've got all this chaos, you've got these incredible innovations happening in quantum computation and artificial intelligence and virtual reality and novel propulsion systems in energy generation, uh, you know, in our understanding of the cosmos with the James Webb telescope basically disproving the Big Bang, you know, it basically said the Big Bang's a load of nonsense because, you know, the old, old there's old galaxies near the beginning of what we think is space-time. How do you get old galaxies near the beginning of space-time if it's the beginning of space-time? So, you know, it, it's, it's a very strange time we live in, you know, highly fluidic, highly dynamic, um, and it, we're in a hyper-accelerated version of evolution. Nothing else on this planet's doing what we're doing. We are in some ways giving birth to the flying saucer, right? We're moving from the monkey to the flying saucer. Indeed, and wonderfully said. You know, we we have been spending, you know, our our in-house team, we've spent a lot of time on AI. Um, one of our big themes for, for a long time, you know, for 15 years has been quantum computing. So we've kept tabs on on that for all the same reasons that a lot of other people do. And I've made my career... Where we've done very well is we we arbitrage exponential curves. So in general, the human brain thinks better in kind of a linear projection. If you're running from a jaguar, you know you need to be able to jump across the canyon or get out of the way. And so that's a that's a, a linear extrapolation. And we're not very good at thinking in terms of of exponential movements. And so we use that. That's part of our kind of you know our bag of tricks for you know finding opportunities in, in markets. And one of the things that we've noticed we I sincerely believe 2023 is an extraordinary inflection point type year for lots of reasons. And I don't think it's coincidence that, you know, exponential increase in, in sightings of the phenomena, disclosure, quantum computing, people of quantum computing, which is, you know, you and I share a fascination with is, is, is almost as kind of on the periphery as AI has dominated the headlines, yeah, yeah. but we should not be, we should not be ignoring no. that fusion with once, those two things. Once go, they combine, <laughs> once they combine. That's the, yeah, that's the moment. And that's, that's, that's on our doorstep. And we, we, we dedicate about anywhere between an hour to two hours a day, um, just looking at, you know, daily, daily progression on, on AI. And for those listening, like AI is grabbing all the headlines. And a lot of my investment professional colleagues, you know, they're investing in Microsoft and Google. They want to have investments in all the companies that are, you know, leading this. And we have a very contrarian view. We're saying that's a waste of money. It, the, the iterative process is so fast. So, you know, Microsoft invested $10 billion in open AI. The open source stuff, the open source community is eating that alive. And they're, they're running at 99% of chat GPT-4 as of last night. And, and you give them another 30 days and they're going to blow past everything that open AI does. And so what was that $10 billion investment worth? But more tantalizing is what happens by the time we even get to the end of the year? This is an exponential curve that nobody's ever seen that's just like absolutely at warp speed, just going straight vertical. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's hard to, to get around some of those things. The other area, too, that I share with a lot of people, part of our theory, um, a perspective, a, a hypothesis on the, the disclosure is that one of our big macro themes is the threat vector of, um, in cybersecurity. So cybersecurity risks is another one of those exponential curves. I was just reading the other day a, a great article in Wired, kind of given the behind the scenes of the SolarWinds hack that took place in the U.S. And SolarWinds being a service provider for the Department of Defense and a lot of the government. And just a brilliant, brilliant, like if nobody's you know read that article, just Google it and look for it. They calculate that in the last three years leading up to that hack, there was a 700% increase in cybersecurity supply chain hacks. I'm not talking supply chains. Those are easy. <laughs> I'm talking the, side, the best of the best of the best of the best, a 700% increase in, in cracking into those, uh, the cybersecurity supply chains. And so you and I have talked about this briefly, uh, you know, a month ago. Um, you got a guy in your backyard. I think also, uh, McKenna was his, his name. Was it George or Greg McKenna, the hacker that got into oh, some of our um, stuff? Um, Gary McKinnon. Oh, wow, Gary McKinnon. Gary McKinnon. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Gary McKinnon. So, you know, he got into our systems 
and you know saw a photo you know that was high res photo with a with a ufo in it so one of our potential themes is not just is that by the way think- not just that he also saw the index that had non-terrestrial officers listed as a, a directory this was in nasa he hacked nasa great great filler there so yeah so everybody listening to this digest that for a moment <laughs> okay <laughs> like let that let that sink in so w- one of our themes is that perhaps one of the ration the the pieces of rationale for let's go ahead and start kind of arranging the narrative from the u.s side and start getting this out into the open is because we probably have some exposure in in material that's you know in the hands of our adversaries perhaps will be leaked on the dark web or anything else and that it's just harder and harder to you know kind of constrain this this information and what's also fascinating too is i I mean i think um and you're super up to speed on this is that with the whistleblower protection that was a big difference because we did have the ndaa of 2022 and now with 2023 people can just openly you know come forward there's a process to it um and correct me if i'm wrong but what I've heard recently is that there's there's something like 20 individuals that are coming for, that have come forward already and talking about the crash retrieval programs. Is that accurate? More than 20 in up, upwards of I believe 23 to 25, something like that. So I, I want to touch on that because that that's very important. Let me quickly reverse back to AI just for a moment to highlight that I think that. In terms of getting more, you know, data integrity with this particular subject, I've said this many times. I'll say it again. Um, I place more faith in the open source scientific and data analysis approach to this subject than I do upon waiting for tidbits of, you know, sanctioned information released from the national security state. I think grassroots efforts, um, you know, private. Uh, industry-funded think tanks and initiatives. And uh, and I have to give a, a shout-out to a guest of mine and a friend of mine, Mikai Morin. And I highly encourage it. He's actually the same person who was in that AI talk I've told your viewers to check out that I did recently. So one such entity is, is Coyus Institute, which is established by Mackay, and he's a specialist in the field of deep tech, trend analysis, and how to leverage AI for global industry. And uh, Basically, uh, and to spell Coyus Institute, it's C-O-E-U-S Institute. So we've recently decloaked um, our stealth project nicknamed JIRA, uh, sorry, G-E-R-A, which stands for Global Event Rating Algorithm. Now, basically, it's an AI leveraged solution that transforms data sets into actionable insights by rapidly identifying the kind of hidden correlations within global events. So it can be tasked with any particular data set you would like. Uh, you add a correlation value in, of, the, of the events and it will basically generate uh, a large data set of how these events correlate. And this can be used for you know multiple markets, but for an example of it, we basically tasked it um, with, a, with a quick glimpse of the UFO community. We tasked it with UFO sightings, and the uh, the proximity of U.S. military bases in relation to those sightings between the years 2014 to 2023. So that was its kind of data set was to correlate, uh, you know, how close of a proximity are these UFOs appearing in front of these military bases. And Jira produced a, a map with all the correlations highlighted, and it showcased that a significant portion of UFO sightings are taking place within close proximity to all these different bases. Uh, so that's just a very small taste of what something like Jira is capable of doing. And it's fascinating. I, so, sorry. To- no, no, it's, it's a fascinating image. So you posted that last yes, night on Twitter. Yeah, so you saw that. And I, re- I retweeted it. So anybody that's following Jay or follows me, you'll see I, I retweeted his post. The image, I mean, you know, the image said, you know, a thousand words. And uh, and it's fascinating. The correlation's clear. <laughs> yeah, the correlation's clear. So, that, you know, we wanted to put our little example uh, specifically for the UFO subject. But uh, again, this can be leveraged for basically any sort of, uh, you know, forecasting in markets and, you know, understanding different global trends and correlations that are a team of analysts might miss, but the AI is not missing. And, you know, that kind of gets into that hyper automation of industry discussion, which can be a bit concerning because AI is coming for your jobs, folks. It's coming for your jobs. Um, but yeah, so reverse engineering, right. All right. So, so one of my, one give, us the, give, give us, give us the lowdown. <laughs> like what, what you, you probably know more about this. I haven't talked to, to the right people than, than anybody, you know, the, the first question people are going to ask, do we have crafts? Are they from off world? And, and where do we currently stand, you know, with our understanding of that, those craft? Okay. So, I mean, you know, we've, we've, we've touched on this before, but as I said, we are definitely in an acclimation process, right? It's the process of gradual dissemination, dissemination of soft intelligence, so to speak, uh, kind of raising the temperature. So degree 
by degree, year by year, they've just been raising that temperature a little bit, right? And I imagine to circumvent some form of mass panic that they believe might occur if too much knowledge on this issue was just dumped into the public domain at once. I, I personally feel that the world is ready to receive more disruptive information than we've uh, we've been given already. And, uh, and yeah, so I mean, if my own sources and other people's sources who are in close proximity to the movements in DC within the executive and legislative branches of the US government are to be believed then it would appear that we are entering into another phase, another degree of this process, entering into the territory of being able to discuss the existence of so-called reverse engineering programs. Because it's one thing for the US government to acknowledge the existence of unknown objects performing radical maneuvers that outstrip our next generation platforms in every way imaginable, which they have already acknowledged, as we highlighted previously. This is now common public knowledge that numerous official statements from the Pentagon, from ODNI, uh, you know, from uh, the uh, Office for Naval Intelligence, uh, you know, all of these uh, different entities within the government have uh, have acknowledged that this has taken place, right, um, with individuals within the military and the intelligence communities and the halls of Congress and the Senate. It's a whole other issue to say that not only are we aware of the existence of these objects, but we have in fact managed to retrieve some of them, that we have in fact been pouring trillions of dollars into clandestine research and development programs over you know, seven decades in an attempt to understand and ultimately exploit these non-human technologies. Now, it's my belief, and it's the belief of quite a few other researchers, and that's uh, you know a belief that's bolstered by statements from people that with, are within Intel or aerospace or have a long-standing history with this subject in an official way that spoke out many years ago and are now dead. Um, there's a paper, there is a paper trail, there is a statement trail to follow if you become a researcher in this field. Um, that this split off, you know, from from the uh, the official military industrial complex uh, of the Eisenhower years, it basically went private industry off the books, off the reservation of standard governmental oversight, out into the wild, basically, and they've been using black money funding. So it could be drug running, it could be arms, it could be trafficking, pouring in billions or trillions off off the radar, working on this stuff that they've managed to basically, uh, you know, take away from the the government over the course of decades. Very powerful subsets of different aerospace corporations, and this is definitely a suspicion of people that this could have happened, right? Um, so one one of my friends and colleagues and, and guest on my channel is John Ramirez. Now he retired at the GS-15 rank, which is comparable to the rank of a colonel uh, from the CIA. Uh, he was in the CIA from 1984 to 2009, served within the Directorate of Science and Technology, the Directorate of um, Intelligence, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Right? When he came on the record with me for the first time, this resulted in him being brought back into the fold a little bit, so to speak, within D.C., and uh, has proven to be a reliable source of information to me now for quite some time. So he made it clear to me not that long ago, and I believe he recently mentioned it in what is now his final interview uh, until things, basically, in, until he has a bit more freedom to talk. He made it clear to me, right, that not that long ago, the admission from government entities in the US that there are materials and that there are craft is going to be made, this admission is going to be made, and that this will likely occur next year when Congress can, uh, codifies into Title 50 legislation, which is the Intelligence Authorization Act. So the last Intelligence Authorization Act we had is the one that brought in this whistleblower testimony and um, you know uh, protections and, and the probe into the uh, interagency intelligence gathering on this issue. So the, the next um, Intelligence Authorization Act, he believes, is going to include uh, this demand, basically, to the CIA that the CIA must disclose this knowledge. And he said we will likely hear... Uh, that the CIA was in charge of the legacy programs and brought the U.S. Air Force early on. We're talking the 1940s period now, right, when when the Roswell uh, crash happened. And um, if people didn't know, by the way, it was around that year that the CIA got fully form formatted into the CIA. I was just going to comment on that. That's and, right. And the Army Air Force split off and became the U.S. Air Force. Like, these two things split off, and we're being told, you know, by a 
former essentially colonel rank gs15 cia uh, officer that um this is going to be a part of the discussion this legacy history of how the cia and the us air force became entangled with one another on trying to understand this stuff and and this will likely occur uh, next year again when this uh, title 50 legislation is brought in by congress which you know should should basically be happening very soon and it's probably worth mentioning in an attempt to kind of bolster these claims from John, that less than a week after he made these statements to me privately, Dr. Gary Nolan, a highly celebrated and esteemed scientist from Stanford University, who is in some shape or form a, a consultant for the CIA on the UFO issue and has been utilized by the agency in an attempt to understand specifically the biological effects on human tissue from close proximity to these objects, which he's acknowledged publicly was one of the reasons for the CIA seeking him out many years ago was to analyze the field effects on biological tissue from these anomalous craft, because these are using most likely high energy systems, electromagnetic disruption, some form of radiation is coming from these vehicles. And the CIA had a whole bunch of cases internally, their operators and other military people uh, who had been damaged, who had had some form of tissue damage um, from close proximity to some of these objects. Um, so Gary Nolan recently took part in the SALT conference in New York City, which is, uh, yeah, I'm sure- Well, this is where it br bridges into to, to my world with the investment community. What? That's basically the first time like the investment community, you know, like on a, on a stage is hearing this stuff. And it was amazing. Yes. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think I need to tell your audience what kind of significant salt has. So, you know, this is not just like a, 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 a with all due respect to my dear community, it's not just a UFO conference, you know, with like a lot of people with dyed hair and you looking crazy. And yeah, it's not that. It's, it was a serious place. And he point blank stated not only that he has 100% certainty that non-human intelligence are visiting this planet, have been visiting this planet for a very long time, and are still present in our world today. This is a... This guy holds like 40 patents. He's considered one of the global leading geneticists, immunologists. He knows what he's talking about when it comes to that type of science, and he's highly accredited in his field. He's got his own wing, I think, in Stanford, or at least a significant he, building. Uh, where he's he, a sharp guy. We're, we, we ha he's coming on the program next month, by the fantastic, way. So for those, fantastic. For those listening, you, you, we're, we're going to get an update. Yeah, you know, fresh there you go. Gary, but he's a sharp guy. He, he definitely tune in. If you're tuning in to me, my God, listen to Gary. You know, I'm, I, I've, I've managed to accumulate uh, information through, you know, a bit of hard work and, and networking and, and talking to some people. But Gary's been, he's in the fold. He's in the real fold, you know, where they're in DC and talking to people in behind us. He helped draft some of the legislation that I was just mentioning, the whistleblower stuff. He helped draft some of that. Um, you know, so this is a serious guy. Please listen to him as well. But he also confidently stated that reverse engineering programs are going to become part of the official discourse, which again is something that was echoed to me by my own sources who work within the CIA or have their ears on the grapevine within Congress and the Senate. So we're entering into a new phase of the conversation where we may be given more insight into the historical involvement of groups such as the US Air Force and the CIA in relation to legacy programs that had access to non-human technologies. And I, I, you know, I really do hope we're going going to see that part of the conversation open up as more testimony is collected from insiders who had access. You know, they had access to intelligence relating to these programs because certain select committees are beginning to hone in on these individuals to collect their testimony. It's happening. It's difficult for many of us to believe it, but it's really happening right now. There is serious momentum behind this discussion in an official capacity. And I think whilst we must always issue challenge and have skepticism towards the government's handling of this issue, especially since it was the intelligence community interference over decades that has led to such an intense stigma being propagated in the first place, right? Um, to, into discussing this UFO issue in a serious manner. It must be acknowledged that the decision to open this subject up in the way it has been by these very same entities of officialdom is a clear sign that something's shifted. And, and as we said before, I suppose the real question is why. And I, I think that's where I'm at right now as a researcher is I'm trying to understand why. I know it's happening. I just want to know what's the real reason for this. Maybe it's something to do with AI, quantum, singularity, these things. It's the new nuclear revolution. Who knows? But there is a why. There is a reason. They did have, they have no reason not to, uh, they have 
every reason not to talk about it is what I meant to say there. They have every reason not to talk about it. All of this dirty, murky history, illegal programs, illegal funding, and they're opening the book. So why? It must be important, right? We've just kind of crossed the hour here. This is a perfect segue to kind of a, a, a final question that, you know, I think that's an important or not even really a question. What, I, what I'd like to ask you to, to share is um, you and, and Dr. Gary Nolan, as well as John Ramirez, the three of you, you guys actually have something in common. And, and I think this is where we kind of tie back in is, you know, we, we agreed that it'd be smart to do this. I wanted to share this. I didn't want to leave this out because I think that it's an important because of what you do. And it's, it's helpful to bring this in and wrap this up at the end rather than the beginning because some people just, you know, they, they don't know where to start on the subject matter. But you yourself are an experiencer. And as is, as is uh, Gary Nolan, he's been very open about that, as is, is John Ramirez. And so, so maybe we could conclude and you, you know, I know it's kind of, uh, tight to kind of pack that in, but if, if you could maybe just take a couple of minutes and, and explain to people, you know, how you got into this, um, through your own personal, uh, experience. Okay. So I know we don't have long, um, so what I will I will explain briefly, but I would really I I would really love it if people would just go to my channel Project Unity, and one of the most recent videos is literally my UFO contact experiences, and you know the thumbnail says this is the reason why I started Project Unity. So I'm only going to be briefly talking about it here. Um, I would really appreciate it because it's it's so outlandish. I'm so aware of how outlandish it is that I really want people to absorb the journey behind how that really happened to me. So this is the short version that's going to be even more of a, a, a kick into the perception of a lot of people, I think. Um, but it did happen. It's pretty much the only reason why I started my YouTube channel and started doing this was that I had my own personal experiences and I had them in that back garden, like literally outside this window. Um, it gets into um, a lot of concepts that could be challenging for people because it wasn't um, uh, an accident that I saw them. I was actually in a process of trying to contact them, uh, which is difficult for people to digest. But I, this comes from my consciousness studies background and my quantum physics studies background, not you know in, in any sort of official way. Again, just a layman, just a kid from the UK, really, who you know, has started to try and pick up on as much as he can. Um, but I, I believe that consciousness has non-local capabilities, meaning that it can extend its influence beyond simply the human brain. I don't, I don't think consciousness is generated entirely by a complex neural network. I think that the human brain is uh, the absolutely fundamental translator and renderer of awareness, but I don't think it's the actual generator of consciousness itself. That's actually a, a very uh, widely debated topic, generator versus receiver. It's, you know, this is a scientific conundrum uh, that we're still trying to understand. And I am far more into the receiver uh, mode of thought when it comes to consciousness. Uh, I think that uh, I'm trying, how much t time do I have, like technically? Let's let's see. You know, you think you could pack in within the next, you know, five minutes? Five I minutes. know that's All right, very okay. I'm doing what I automatically do. I'm trying to lay down the like foundational framework to get it. Okay, I saw a triangle formation of orange orbs of light appear above my head. It came out of a cloud. It came out of a cloud, and like the, I'm not kidding you, this cloud was drifting across my sky. It did a right angle turn. It came above my head. It dissipated in a matter of moments and inside it was a triangle formation of orbs. I then saw those orbs on three other occasions, including an occasion where they flew across the sky, stopped on a dime, started to de uh, descend and basically loitered above my house. Three orange orbs, roughly the size of basketballs, kind of a pastel orange color, slightly transparent, almost ghost-like, um, but they were real. They changed my life forever. And it's uh, still a process of integrating that into my psyche, to be honest, that I had those experiences. It came from me getting into very basic meditative states of consciousness and imagining myself to project my intentions out into the you know space-time framework that I would like to have some form of a communication or connection or show me something. As people have said throughout the many thousands and thousands of years of theology, show me a sign, universe, show me something. You know, the, uh, the request was, was answered. The request was answered. So I can uh, only, you know, 
back up the credibility of that with my own testimony and I recognize just how ridiculous it does sound. But if you go to my YouTube channel, I have covered it more extensively. I do try and explain some of the science behind why I think this is possible for human consciousness, that there are sophisticated intelligences that can pick up on the subtle frequency shifts available to us in our in our bio computational system. We're like a human we're a biological quantum computer, essentially. And that's what a lot of physicists and quantum mechanics specialists are coming to the conclusion of. It's like, oh, we're like an organic quantum computer. So imagine you're connected to everything else on the network of the universe, and I think that's how you make it work. Check out my video for a better description. Jay, that's 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 beautiful. And I suspect that, first of all, thank you for your bravery and openness in sharing that. You're welcome. Because, y- you know, one, it's very personal, right? And so, you know, also I, I, I encourage everybody to go over to Jay's channel so they can get the full, you know, the full background on that. Um, second, I think that, you know, what you're going to find, I'm sure we're going to find a lot of people in this audience that have also had their own experiences. Oh, yeah, they're and, hiding. You know, they're, they're hiding out there. They're out there. They're, they're out there for sure. So, so really appreciate everything that you do. Um, just as kind of a, a, you know, last piece, where, where can everybody find you, Jay? Where, where should they follow you and, and tune into your, your work? Yeah. So, I mean, you can follow me quite literally on Project Unity on YouTube. So if you type that in, I should come up uh, hopefully at the top. I, 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 I seem to most of the time, but maybe the algorithm suppresses it. Either way, Project Unity is uh, pretty easy to find on YouTube. You can also get me on Twitter, which is at the Project Unity. Um, so they're basically my main platforms. If you want to email me, uh, my actual uh, business email is j full stop unity at protonmail.com all right j full stop unity at protonmail.com you can get hold of me there if you want to reach out for any sort of uh you know interview prospects or or have information you would like to share then uh, don't hesitate to get in touch i always try and get back to people when they email me Wonderful. Well, Jay, it's been a pleasure having you. Really appreciate it. We will definitely have you back on here. This was such a treat having you to, to kick off this series. Um, and with that, Neil, I'll, uh, I'll hand it back over to you, sir. Thank you so much, David and Jay, for a guided tour into some of these incredibly fascinating, but at the same time, some really hard to comprehend topics. There were so many takeaways besides the excellent recap by Jay in terms of the big events that has led us to what we know today about some of these best-kept secrets. And of course, I enjoyed to learn about some of the people that facilitated the acceleration of momentum in the publication of these details. I also found Jay's perspective on the question of why now very insightful. And last but not least, I think all investors should think about the topic of AI and how it may play out differently to other inventions in the sense that it may not be the firms that have invested billions of dollars in buying up AI firms that may win the battle. Because when you are dealing with an exponentially growing industry, a lot of open source and free options may well eat up the firms that spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year in development costs. The fact is that AI is here and we all need to form an opinion about it. Make sure you go and follow Jay's and David's work because, as you can tell from today's conversation, there are so many exciting facets to learn from those who have been following this topic for a number of years. And we really look forward to exploring many more of them as we continue our series. From David and me, thanks so much for listening and we look forward to being back with you on the next episode. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.